Tonight on Joy News Prime, the 10-year-old boy who was allegedly murdered by two teenagers at Kaswa has been buried after the body was released to the family Thursday. Meanwhile, one more person has been arrested in connection with the crime, bringing to four the number of suspects being held for the murder. An arrest that was made yesterday uh, of one charity Mensa, who is a priestess and a nursing mother. And then, of course, one other guy with the name Desmond Ni AJ, who is 27 years. 50-year-old commercial bus driver seven time in jail for causing the death of 34 people in the murder accident at Dompoise in the central region has expressed regret and asked for forgiveness. Man who can in time and we pay for it as an equity. The medium from Swatu, the Kotodugo for me, Paul Mangan and Nacho, and your Makua, the Slowomo, or Mobo, Bonibia, and Dayo Bia, Media, or Mangan, and Pian in the Pebby or Trina Crebiano, or Fine Chamber. Also in this bulletin, Energy Minister announces the incessant blackouts being experienced in many parts of the country will get worse before it eventually gets better. This time following a request by the Millennium Development Authority. In the month of May, there will be systematic power outages. So we have invited both ECG and Great Go. And in the light of that, Let's sit and plan and communicate to the people who will be affected way before it happens. Meanwhile, presidents of uh, residents of Kumasi, I beg your pardon, have been given what may well be an official part rationing shadow. We've alerted the customers to be on a guide. That's seven two. Yes, we don't know today it can come today, it might not come tomorrow. And business energy expert calls on Gridco to post plans to export electricity to Mali, describing the move as possible but premature. I believe that we need to fix whatever issues that we have within our internal capabilities as in transmission, then we can uh, uh, think about exporting. My name is Aisha Prime. Joining us, Prime comes to you live from our studios in Kukum Limle here in Accra on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air and also on DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 144. Remember, this is the home of independent, fearless, credible and impactful journalism. Many thanks for choosing us. In our very first story, electricity consumers in various parts of the country already complaining about erratic power supply are to expect more outages, particularly in the month of May. This, according to the Energy Minister, follows a request from the Millennium Development Authority, which is funding the upgrade of an aspect of the power infrastructure. At a meeting with officials of ECG and Gridco, as well as some CSOs in the sector on Thursday, Mr. Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe explained the outages are expected to intensify as a result, but insisted the blackouts are not the doom so caused by lack of generation. There's more in the following report. Power transmitter, grid co and distributor ECG to the civil society organizations through the causes of the recent outages and the solutions to the problem. Um, we are working together with MIDA, with ECG and other stakeholders because in order to complete these projects, the contractors are coming to us and say that for them to interconnect what they've done to the network, we have to give them outage. It is just like an electrician coming to your house. You say, oh, I have, you have a wiring problem, so come and resolve for me. The electrician, electrician comes and says, um, Madam, sir, I want to what? switch off your mains because he has to work in what safety these SCADA systems are control centers remote control centers so when there is a fault uh, we can we can do switching from the 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 control center we don't have to drive to the substation to to carry out switching and when that is done it also improves system reliability 
the CSOs were not impressed. So to the consumer, we always ask for more, more efficiency. And the fact is, we don't care about your grammar. We don't care about your figures and your graph and your charts. We want our power. I mean, my question is very simple. What is happening? What is going on? I mean, broadly, what is it? Because today you hear um, we are doing some repairs here. There is a problem there. Um, the outage is going to end in June. It is going to end in November. Now I'm hearing in May some um, doom saw or load shedding in May in a specific area. What is happening? Because I'm a consumer. We are worried. You be at home, your light is off. You have a planned meeting. You cannot have the meeting because the light is off in your office. You can't do much. It's not because Pokwasi is not developed. It's not because we are now fixing uh, 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 Kaswa. It's because of systemic issues that has to do with planning and following through plans. The officials provided answers to these concerns. We purchased uh, power from the IPPs. And uh, the amount of uh, payment that we make uh, Normally, it's not enough. So, government sometimes bail us out by paying some of the IPPs, and uh, we do a cross debt analysis and take it from their debt they owe us. So, when it comes to the national debt, as the uh, uh, organizer said, we cannot push anything to the government debt stock or anything like that. But what EC can say is that. The amount of money that government owes us, based on the MDAs, is paid through payment to the IPPs. Energy Minister Matthew Poku Prempe says there will be more outages in May. In the month of May, around my birthday, there's going to be... <laughs> I wonder what a birthday present I was going to get. Um, there will be systematic power outages. So we have invited both ECG and Great Co. And in the light of that, let's sit and plan and communicate to the people who will be affected way before it happens. For many power consumers, stable power supply remains the need. Meanwhile, ECG has given a hint of how power outages will be carried out in Kumasi. The one is the one is loaded, congested, and they are trying to build another territory. So during the peak period, the load increases, and then we don't want the system to collapse. So they will take us off, so that it will bring down the load. So we've elected the customers to be on the guide. That's serving to yes, we don't know today. It can come today. It might not come tomorrow. It, 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 it depends the load balancing. That's why we are not here to give any timetable that tomorrow we're going to go off or yes, uh, the next day we're going to go off. One more person has been arrested in connection with the gruesome killing of the 10-year-old boy at Kaswa. The latest arrest brings to four, the people being held in connection with the crime. Apart from the two teenagers accused of the murder, a fetish priestess was arrested by the Central Region Police on Wednesday. The headquarters of the Criminal Investigations Department has meanwhile also taken over investigations. DSP Giuliano Bing speaks for the police CID. I can just continue to confirm an arrest that was made yesterday uh, of one charity mensa who is a priestess and a nursing mother. And then, of course, one other guy with the name Desmond Ni AJ, who is 27 years, for the alleged involvement in the uh, murder of a 10 year old boy at Kaswa. We are still going on with investigations and if there's a need for us to, as it were, make more arrests or as it were, uh, review what our colleagues in the central region have already done, we will do that. But I have the assurance from the CID administration and the Ghana Police Service as a whole, led by the Inspector General of Police, that um, there's going to be justice and justice will duly be served going through the legal processes and the due process. There are lots of details, but unfortunately we are not able to share these details with you at this time. 
reason being that investigation is still ongoing. We are looking forward to probably uh, tomorrow or the days coming ahead where we can properly come back with full details of uh, uh, proceedings after investigations conducted so far. But for now, we want to just encourage the public to help us with investigation and of course, encourage us to be circumspect in our reportage. It's quite sentimental. There are emotions involved in this case. So we want to be careful how we go about the reportage. Quite a sad one there. Meanwhile, friends and classmates of the deceased have described him as a generous and kind boy who always shared whatever little he had. Scots of people gathered Thursday for his burial at the Manfred Cemetery in Kaswa after his body was eventually released by the police. We'll bring you this report later, but my colleague Maxwell Agbaba has been digging into the background of the 18-year-old suspect by interacting with his grandfather, residents, and the Royal Majesty College of the Great Lamptey Mill School, where he is a first-year SHS student. Some young residents of the community where the killing took place are gathered here still discussing the gruesome incident. Here, I've met Stanley and son, a footballer. Stanley says the 18-year-old suspect was a childhood friend who loved church activities until he started associating with what he describes as bad company. I would say I knew Nicholas by the age of, let's say, 10 to 11 years. And then we've all been in the same wood. He came to my father's house. We sleep together, we eat together, we go to church together. And then he was, he was a kid that, uh, even when we are going to our hometown, he go with us. He was like a family boy. I am now at the home of the 18-year-old suspect. His grandfather, Noah Kinney, just okay. unlocked his door to show me how he was lying on his bed an hour before he left the house to commit the alleged act. Noah Kinney says his grandson gained admission to a secondary school in the Volta region but was unable to enroll due to financial constraints. He later managed to get him a place at the Royal Majesty College of Great Lamptey Mills. On the day the incident happened, did you see him? Oh yeah, I wake up the morning, his room is in the corner here. So I wake up and I knock the door, they open the door already. So I see a line on the bed and I greet him. What is happening on you? He said the heart was paining. So before the same day, 10.30 going before 11, then I have a messenger here told me that Nico and somewhere have killed somebody. Uh, I confuse. But I don't have anything to say about that. Many of the residents I interacted with used some uncomplimentary words to describe the behavior of the 18-year-old suspect. They told me he was once arrested on the charge of defilement. A police source confirmed the claim. Noah Kinney denied the allegation but said the only time his grandson was arrested by police was when a man he used to work for accused him of stealing $10,000 four months ago. Nico, they are working in a large compound, about five of people. So I don't know reason a large point Nico alone that you go and sweep in hall. So after sweeping in hall, and a large say, it's $10,000 I have lost in the room. I'm an old person. I don't believe. Noah Kinney told me his grandson was a staunch member of the Hope Generation Church in Kaswa, but stopped at a point. He warned him to stay away from bad friends. Uh, first, you couldn't pray with church. He was in the Kalabuli church. I don't know, as a Kodjubos in, in church. Uh, a Hope Generation. That's the church he was attending. But very soon he could stop going to church again. Mm. Uh, because of that, I was quarreling with her that you're supposed to be in the church by this time. Mm -hmm. Mm. So it's a Christian. Because when you, you are a young boy, are coming and you have a too much of friend, 
everything can happen, like what we are seeing now. But still. Well, I'm currently here um, at the Royal Majesty College of Great Lantern Mills. Um, here is where one of the suspects' schools. I've been speaking to the administrator of the school, Sophia Lamte, who says she was shocked by the news. No, the boy, we don't know much about him. We had beaten him like four days, then we vacated. So the school is now on vacation. So we don't know much about him. He just came as a news today. He didn't even report early. He came late. We admitted him late. I'm shocked because I know him. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. I'm shocked. I've seen him. Not that I know him much. No. He's just a newcomer in the school. And the school doesn't even know much about him. So. Meanwhile, a member of the Defence and Interior Committee in Parliament and Cratcher West MP Helen Ntosu wants government to take steps to ban the activities of fraudulent traditional priests and spiritualists who use the media to propagate get-rich-quick messages. So, as a member of the committee, I think that um, I will inform the chairman about it and then uh, we will invite the IG, we will uh, invite the National Security Coordinator, we will invite... Um, the, 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 the interior minister so that we sit and have a chat with them, have a discussion as to the way forward. I'm always interested in the way forward because this things happen, you know, people, we, we talk about it, we talk about it, we talk about it and nothing happens. Even if something is done, just something little is done. But that's one, I think it's a high time that we, we, we all come together as a people to, to f look for the way forward that what do we do to solve this kind of thing? And one thing that we can do, uh, like I suggested, is stopping those people who are on TVs proclaiming that they can double money, proclaiming that they can uh, make people have money, you know, overnight. That is the first step we have to take. The second step is that I think the, 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 this community watchdog, the community watchdog thing, we have to be encouraged so that you look out for people who are in the community that do, do not want to work and then you, uh, any suspicious movement, then, then you, 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 you question. We, I mean, in this country, something will have to be done about it. That uh, young guys, young guys of 19, 18, 16 years want to kill someone. In the last few hours, the Catholic Bishops' Conference has released a statement regarding their, um, expressing their sentiments on what has happened. And it reads, we, the members of the Ghana Catholic Bishops' Conference, woke up to the bizarre and shocking news of the alleged murder of Ishmael Ismail Mensa Abdallah by two teenagers during the peak of the Easter celebrations. This sad and gruesome incident which took place in Kaswa exposes us as a people and as a nation and calls for the need for an urgent intervention to avert further occurrences in the future. It it further states that we live in a country where wealth is celebrated and elevated above everything, where the rich are worshipped without questioning the source of their wealth, where good leadership qualities are equated to donations, where individuals believe they have to make money by hook or by crook, where the end justifies the means. The hurried action of these teenagers should serve as a wake-up call for us to find out what has gone wrong with us as individuals, as a people, as a nation, why we are where we are today. Perhaps we have lost our moral compass as individuals, a people, and a nation. It is hard to hear that the decision of these teenagers was to kidnap their victim for a ransom and then present the victim to a spiritualist for rituals. Thoughts derived from watching some of the audiovisual content on television with a promise to make people wealthy within a short period of time and it says it is time for us to begin to chart a new path for ourselves as individuals as a people as a nation if we intend to build a country with people who appreciate the need for hard work honesty values integrity 
and the desire for genuine acquisition of wealth as opposed to the current situation of thirsting for quick wealth by hook or by crook. As we look forward to a possible solution to our current situation, we commend the soul of the young Ismail Mensah Abdallah to the mercy of God and pray for consolation for the parents and the entire family and for divine guidance on these and many other misguided teenagers in our modern world. We'll be bringing you the story on the burial of little Ismail Mensah Abdallah shortly within the bulletin. But in other stories, the seat of government, the Jubilee House, Kotoka International Airport, Temahaba and other key national assets are in danger of destruction should there be an earthquake in Ghana. This is because the facilities lie in an earthquake zone that stretches from central, greater Accra, eastern and Volta regions. The zone has already experienced three major earthquakes in 1615, 1636 and 1939, even though there have been other tremors. Accepting a recommendation of a committee put together to advise government on where Ways to contain earthquakes in the country. President Ekofuado, among others, directed the engineering department of the Works and Housing Ministry to undertake an integrity audit of all public buildings and determine their state of preparedness to handle disasters. It is also important that the ministries of Works and Housing and local government decentralization and rural development collaborate with the Ghana Institution of Engineers to develop a scheme that will entail homeowners retrofitting their homes to make them resistant to a resident, to ensuring the government protects the entire citizenry from the effects of earthquakes and other disasters that might ravage any part of the nation. Government has sufficiently demonstrated its determination to make the nation resilient to the effects of disasters. And we will continue to equip NADMO and indeed all response agencies to enhance their operational effectiveness. Director General of NATMO, Eric Nana Ajeman Prempe, talks about the areas likely to be worst hit in the event of an earthquake in Ghana. Earthquake fault line, the zone gets to Ho and then it passes through Eastern region, the whole of Greater Accra region, and then it ends at Nyanyano in the central region. So these are the areas. And if you recall, when we experienced the earth tremors, especially the last one, when the magnitude was high, people felt it in so many places. And this, these are the areas. So it is there. We know it since 1939. And this is the time we have to work and prepare ourselves because anything can happen. That is, this is a natural disaster. Nobody can determine today or tomorrow, but it can happen at any, any time. It has happened before. And you give us a fourth list of some of the specific areas, including our very own Jubilee House. Yes, what I'm trying to say is that the fourth line is here in Accra, where the Jubilee House is, where Kolebu is, where Bema Camp is, the ministries, and they are all on top of the fourth line. So anything, when earthquake strikes i mean it can affect any of such state institutions or state properties and so to come in this bulletin a 50 year old commercial bus driver serving time in jail for causing the death of 34 people in the murder accident at domposa in the central region has expressed regret and asked for forgiveness Man who can in time and we pick who in as an equity to be from sort of me the country go for me for my gun in nature i am a quiet the slow one in business, energy expert calls on Gridco to post plans to export electricity to Mali, describing the move as plausible but premature. I believe that we need to fix whatever issues that we have within our internal capabilities as in transmission, then we can uh, uh, think about exporting. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kukum Limli. We'll be back with more. You're welcome to Business. I'm Charles Aite. The Ghana Grid Company has begun...
some discussions to export power to Mali through the West African power pool after ongoing works on the transmission lines are completed. According to Director of Systems Operations of Greco, Mark Iwaba, Mali will be added to other West African nations that the country is currently supplying power to due to its consistency in generating power at a cheaper cost. He was speaking at a civil society and media engagement forum in Accra. We need this high voltage because you are sending the power throughout Ghana and even across our borders. When you do it at very low voltages, it won't work. The power won't reach. We have neighbors. So we are interconnected on the western side uh, with uh, Cote d'Ivoire, on the east with Togo Benin, and in the north with um, Burkina Faso. Uh, very soon, there is some work being done in order to interconnect Ghana with Mali. And all these are being done because we believe in ourselves, and in fact, they also believe in us that we should be able to export more to them. And in order for us to export power, you need the interconnectors. So that's why we are building these. So what, what you see on the left side is what we call the West African Power Pool, where we are interconnecting all the 14 of the 15 countries in ECOWAS so that where there is insufficient energy or it is more costly to produce energy, uh, those who can produce this at a lesser cost, cost can supply other countries. So that is the purpose of uh, the interconnectors. Meanwhile, energy expert Dr. Isif Suleiman has urged government to pull the brakes on recent plans by Gridco to export power to Mali. At a meeting with stakeholders, the CSOs, the Gridco explained, as we've already stated, that Ghana has excess power supply amid recent outages. But speaking earlier on business life, Dr. Yusuf Suleiman expressed the need for stakeholders to consider cleaning up the issues related to the faulty transmission lines before considering possible exports to neighboring Mali. If renewables can come to the extent that they can be in commercial basis, there's going to be competition and cost wise is going to come down. So I think going forward, that is a call in the right direction. We have to double up. And one suggestion I can give is in most jurisdictions, if you look at uh, uh, most jurisdictions in Ghana, for instance, I think we have an uh, energy commission championing the uh, issue of renewables. Mm. Can we think about uh, our national oil company, let's say GMPC championing that or, may, or supporting that? You know, because our, our success in the renewables will come from the successes in the fossil fuel, you know, uh, portions of it. Exactly. Exactly. You have to be able exactly. to gravitate. Not to, not, yeah. not to catch you there, but it, it, it also poses, you know, concerns of the cost element, because as you rightly stated, currently it's so much expensive to venture into renewables as to the conventional and even traditional way of energy transmission. But just before you leave, Doctor, exporting power to Mali, I mean, is this too early a conversation to start? We did hear that from Gridco. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I mean, domestically, uh, we, 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 we are still struggling to, you know, sort ourselves out. Nevertheless, it should be a call in the right direction, especially if we have robust investment. I mean, we have massive investment into the transmission system. Already the generations are we are already saying we have excess capacity. And so if you have robust transmission system, why not? I think it's, 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 not, it's, it's not a bad call. But I think let's fix our home. Let's make sure that our internal capabilities are well catered for. Then we can think about that. Um, however, concurrently, it is not a bad idea. I mean, we can think about that. Let's also think about investing in that. But I believe that we need to fix whatever issues that we have within our internal capabilities as in transmission. Then we can uh, think about exporting. From Energy, Ghana's premier mobile lottery star 787 Hash has rewarded a pipeline technician from Spintex, a suburb of Accra, 20,000 cities in the prize in the just ended Easter mega draw held on Saturday. Here's more. Richmond Abrazi Hefron, who hails from Spintex, Accra, said his 20,000 cities unique prize will aid him elevate the face of his pending project. Overjoyed Richmond expressed gratitude to the 787 lottery and urged all to partake in this week's 275,000 cities promising jackpot. With 25 Ghana cities, I've won 20,000 uh, 20, Ghana cities. I'm so excited and I thank God and as well as the company itself for introducing this game. I will encourage 
all my friends to try it. It's not as a or some scam. It's rare. It's rare. Seven, eight, seven. The head of customer experience, Richard Akotobanfo, at the event announced Star 787 Hash has choked off special draws and prizes this year. However, this Saturday, April 10, 2021, Mega Draw promises a whooping 275,000 cities jackpot plus a guaranteed 20,000 cities unique prize. In addition to the Mega Jackpot draw, 50 players also stand a chance of winning 200 cities each every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday each week. This Saturday, together with our weekly draws, special draws, which is, which is held on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, where you stand a chance to win 200 Ghana cities with only a ticket purchase on that day. You also stand a chance for a guaranteed 20,000 Ghana cities unique prize and a 275,000 Ghana cities jackpot. My friend, this can be your moment. Just pick your phone now. All you need is just your phone number. With your mobile wallet, you can take home this 275,000 Ghana cities and the 20,000 unique guaranteed prize. This is a changing moment for your life. So take that moment and opportunity now. Well, that's how we end business. My name is Charles IT Sport is up next. Thank you for staying with us on Joy News Prime. I'm Gary Alsmith and this is The Sport. Sport is deemed a male-dominated field and indeed it is. Few women venture um, into the arena most of the time. I mean, the numbers are increasing, but those who have mostly often leave neutrals in awe and inspired because they are probably so good at what they do. Talk of Serena Williams in tennis, Mata for football, Katie Taylor in boxing. What about kickboxing. There are few stories to share, not even globally, but Sylvia Dogan is aiming to make some history. She's currently Ghana's first female professional boxer looking to change the narrative. Joy Sports' Asari Bidiako tells the story of the sport through her eyes. If you give a little more than you take And if you try to fix more than you break If you're the kind who takes the time to help a stranger in the rain There's a place for people like you These are the opening lyrics of Sylvia Doge's favorite song. It was sung by Graham Morgan. The title is People Like You. And yes, athletes like Sylvia Duga are rare. She hails from Mepe in the Volta region of Ghana and she is at a place many female athletes dread to be. She has entered a dangerous territory, kickboxing. It is a stand-up combat sport based on kicking and punching. It is not a sport for the faint-hearted. Most of my life I tried different sports. Uh, I did running. Uh, weightlifting, yoga, and kickboxing, and I think kickboxing just fits well right for me. Like, I love it. I enjoy doing it, and I think it's the best. It's the only time I'm truly myself, and and so that's it. My mom is my biggest cheerleader. She she supports me 100 uh, percent. She's always been a an athlete, but. I, I'm just picking up from where she left off, so she's, she's, she's my biggest supporter. My sister, she supports me greatly, my siblings. My, my father is late, so uh, yeah. But everyone around me supports me. I think it, it gives me a lot of strength to keep going. Unlike many female athletes whose parents oppose their decision to venture into sports, Sylvia Duga has the full support of his mother and siblings. For her, kickboxing is not a preserve of males. It's just a perception. So I'm just here to prove everybody wrong that everyone can participate in this and, and do great. So women, everyone, it's, it, it's a good sport. It builds a lot of confidence and, and it's very good for defense. And I think it's the, one of the best sports. We should encourage a lot of women and children and everybody to participate in. Sylvia Duga is Ghana's only female kickboxer who competes at the Russian Grand Prix, which comes off in Moscow later this year. She has no doubt she will return to Ghana with a gold medal. I think I'm, I'm prepared, I'm ready, and I'm going for it. 
So what's your target going into the competition? I'm going for a win. I'm going for a win. I'm going for gold. Lots of gold. I'm just going to win. Win or nothing else. That's, that's my mantra. Because everyone is now looking up to me to see what I've got. So I think I'm just going to smash it and be the best. Everyone, and prove everyone wrong. <laughs> I want to make everyone around me really proud. I, I want to make myself proud. I want to make my family proud. I want to make people from my town proud. I want to make uh, my MP proud. I want to make Ghana proud. I want to make everybody proud. Everyone that knows me, I want to make them really, really proud of me. Doga, who is eager to make Ghana proud in Russia, draws inspiration from Ghana's boxing legend Azuma Nelson. I kind of look up to Azuma Nelson, he's, he's a legend, and if he's been able to do it from here to the world, I think I, I can also do, I can also get out there and, and be my best. I want to be the best ever of my time from here, from Ghana. <laughs> The journey may be long and the road bumpy, but with determination, hard work and desire, Sofia Duga, writing her name in the history books of Ghana sports, is as inevitable as night gives way to day. Nice one. So that's the sport for now. And for the moment, when we come back, we'll be updating you on what's going on in the Europa League and more. I'm Gary Alsby. Thank you for your time. And those of you watching on Joy Prime, that'll be it. There's more on myjoinline.com. When you log on, there are so many stories there if you log on. So these are some of them. Kasua Meda, second accused, was once arrested for stealing, according to his grandfather. There are a number of stories uh, when you log on to My Joy Online. You also get updates of all the developing stories. Welcome back to Journey Prime. Now to the rest of our stories. Friends and classmates of the deceased have described him as a generous and kind boy who always shared whatever little he had. We're talking about the 10-year-old who was murdered in Kaswa by two teenagers for ritual purposes. Scores of people gathered Thursday for his burial at the Manfrom Cemetery in Kaswa after his body was eventually released by the police. And uh, Maxwell Agbaba has been following this for Joy News. Tears as the hairs carrying 10 year old Ishmael pulls up in front of his residence. Uncontrollable wailing as mothers and children could not hold back their tears. of life have gathered to see their final goodbyes. Ishmael is on a stretcher covered with a piece of cloth. Islamic prayers are being recited for him. Little Ishmael has been described as an intelligent um, child. He was in class four at the Manata Primary Engineer High School. I've been speaking to um, his best friend who tells me that he's going to miss the daily sobolo that he buys for him every day after school. So someone, someone told me, uh, Madam Felicia. Mm. He told me, I mean, I, I thought that Madam Felicia was lying. But mm. in, the, in the Tuesday, yeah. when, I, when I go to school, I, oh, my, my teacher told me that my best friend, and then I see that. He's lying. Everybody was saying. And I go and watch the video on my teacher's phone. You watched the video? Yes. On my teacher's phone, I saw it that Abdullah have done. It was a bad news. What are your fondest memories of him? Every day, every day when I don't have money, and Abdullah will give me money to go and buy. You, you give money to what? Go and buy. Okay. And also, every day, if you close, some woman sells so good. You buy one CD for me. You buy one CD for me. If you ask Abdullah, so you should buy one CD so for you. He will buy it. Mm. He will buy it, and he's a very good boy. 
It's a good boy. And he's very kind to me. I've also been talking to um, his class teacher who says his contributions towards class discussions will definitely be missed. He's very good. He's obedient. He's not a doubt type. He's always punctual in class. He really loves everybody in the school. He's caring, he's generous, he's kind. So even his friends can testify to that. He really loves everyone in the class. He's always in class. So we can't, we can't forget Ishmael just like that. No one expected this to happen to, to Ishmael. Okay. So we are, we are all down. We are in examination week and then things are not going on well for us because our spirit, our spirit is not up. We are, we are really down, we are really down. Even the energy that the children has for the exam is what is, it's down, it's down, it's down. What, what are your fondest memories of him? Mm, so anytime I ask questions in class, he'll be like, say please I want to answer, say please I want to answer. So he has this, um, he wants to attempt, you see, uh -huh. he, he wants to attempt any question you ask in class and, and I think he's good, he's good. He's loving, he's caring and generous. It appears to be the end of the road for little Ishmael, but persons who are gathered here um, believe that it is actually um, the beginning of a better journey. I'm um, ongoing right now our final prayers, which have been um, said for um, his soul. But I've been speaking to a member of the communications committee in parliament and member of parliament for Botiano English, a man from Sylvester Tete. He wants authorities to clamp down on the activities of fraudulent traditional priests who use the media to propagate get-rich-quick messages. Well, uh, I'm a member and a vice chairman of the Communications Committee in Parliament, mm -hmm. where these things, the laws force and our purview. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come back to that discussion. I believe that they are calling it, but we'll come back to have that but discussion. What do you think should be done in the interview? Well, we need to have the law to regulate content on our, on our media space. Uh, the point is that all the reasons people are ascribing to are possible but equally speculative unless police investigate of course we have the world standard of police per uh, 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 a thousand persons in an area and of course we need some uh, uh, infrastructure to be able to combat crime in every vicinity so we won't rule out uh, lack of uh, uh, logistics or lack of uh, enough presence of police men and women but this particular incident i'm not too sure in a neighborhood like this, you have to have a police officer uh, 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 policing two or three young people playing in the vicinity. I'm not too sure, no matter the degree of policing you give in the community, will require this. Uh, crime is a crime, irrespective of how it comes. And uh, I know that crime anywhere is treated as such. We must go, the influx of foreigners, of course, Ghana is a big country, play host to a lot of people. It does not mean we should lose our guard as far as security is concerned because of influx of our neighbors coming into this country. So for me, I think that, that uh, we must, as a matter of fact, intensify our security. We must, as a country and as a community also, be our neighbors keeper. Very pathetic story. The hearts goes to the family. And we pray that little Ismail is granted al -Jannah when he meets his maker. Now, a commercial bus driver serving time in jail for his role in a motor accident that claimed 34 lives has asked for forgiveness from Ghanaians. 50-year-old Mark Mriku was found guilty in the accident at Don Poise in the central region last year. Unlike many convicts, Mark accepts responsibility for the accident. He speaks about how it all happened for our latest hotline documentary, Crashed. In January 2020, mortuaries in and around the central region received scores of such bodies. They were involved in that Dumpuasi fatal accident, which claimed at least 34 lives. The accident happened at dawn and three vehicles were involved. Mark Miracle was one of the drivers and he admits his negligence caused that accident. 44 people were in his bus and 22 of them died. 
the other 12 were in the other bus. And because I'm not sure what I'm going to say, Papa, I'm going to throw for it. So I said, National Road Safety, I'm going to say, 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 Mais vous pouvez vous donner un peu de temps et vous pouvez vous donner un peu de temps. Mark Mirku est 50 ans. La Cape Coast High Court a été jugé 5 ans pour la mort de manslaughter. Je ne sais pas si vous avez eu un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si vous avez eu un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si vous avez eu un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si vous avez eu un peu de temps. Je ne sais pas si vous avez eu un peu de temps. Sa ni pani ni na umu na wabu shia formu wa yirene ma umu shia umu beta basa e yado mwenye kume wonya kwa ishia e bateli pa huo misre. He has been a commercial driver for the past 25 years. He says this is his first accident. In his remorseful state, Mr. Miriku tells me he deserves every bit of the punishment. Na mi fia se dumu pia mentu nafi akwa ni asa ni nemo. Kamesi dese mnyia babya kabi ya kabosu mi babya kura na kumnyia babya umbetu mi afre mi nanka meno makasa ewo mkuishi ya mnyia yeye muni hawa mafu muna mnyia dawa ni bisho tewe mwa wanya afahu experience bino nusu dieto nihu fo nti sana mesta o mainga nini na the court has banned him from operating as a commercial driver for life. Mark Miriku says he has learned his lessons. All he needs now is forgiveness from Ghanaians. Paya mda chopa kesi ma, ebusi ya phone sisi busi ya moshile wama adofuoni wamumbano. Nyangu pongeza wamane mo, na nyangu pongo, ah uyi, baby free wanu wadi diema kesi ya asha wana mama mama wamano. Ebi ane sa ni pana yeye eshe busi ano, nyangu pongo mo kwa intu baby kwa ni, na mama busi ano adueti chini na wanyesha busi ana ne mo, ema me. Though a driver would have gone through all the testing regime and would have been certified to drive, an accident could still happen when fatigue sets in, when there is a mechanical fault or when the driver is engaged in other destructive activities like phone calls. The Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority is in the process of unraveling the raw alcohol. The crash documentary produced by Seth Kwan Boating airs on Monday, April 12th. Stay tuned in for that documentary. Now, managers of the Kumasi Central Prison say they are financially constrained and unable to purchase drugs for sick inmates. Though they receive government support, they say it is not enough and are compelled to appeal to the public for support. The authorities also find it worrying the daily one CD 80 pesos feeding fees for inmates at the Kumasi Central Prisons. Mona Lisa Frimpong has more in the following report. A breakdown indicates every inmate is entitled to an amount of 60 pesos per meal. Reverend Canon Chief Superintendent Emmanuel Parkwisiansa is regional chaplain of the Kumasi Central Prisons. So as for the program, we have a lot of programs here, especially drugs. When they are sick, we take them to the hospital, we need to buy drugs for them. That becomes a problem. The government is doing his best, but still, we need the support of the outside. He's feeding them once the 80 pesos a day. You can imagine. So we need the support of everybody. But not all of them are criminals. Some is by accident. Some is just a uh, misunderstanding that they find themselves in the prison. So we are also appealing to other people to come to our aid. The Evangelical Presbyterian Church of Ghana, Divine Grace Amakom Parish, donated cash, food staff and toiletries to support the Kumasi Central Prisons. Reverend Obed Kwamia Joga says it is a core mandate for Christians to donate to others. He encourages churches and individuals to reach out to the inmates regularly. We've uh, realized that uh, the number of inmates here are uh, more and uh, the government alone cannot take care of them and uh, as christians it is our call mandate to support people like this out of that we can save their lives too and so we are here to do this uh, presentation to assist the government as time goes on we will definitely come here to support and even not just here extend our hands elsewhere to support the inmates. Yeah. Mona Lisa Frimpon reporting. 
And to other news, imagine a piggery and a fish pond inside a crop farm. The piggery providing manure for the crops, the crops providing feed for the pigs, and the fish, whilst wastewater from the fish pond is used for fertilizer. This is basically the cycle involved in agroecology, a farming system that is now being promoted by the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, um, CICOD, the Peas and Farmers Association of Ghana, and their partners. With the emergence of the chemical for that system, it says it's the best way to produce organic food while protecting the environment at the same time. Joy News' Upper East Regional Correspondent Albert Sori visits some agroecology farms and now reports. Joseph Abarike has three micro gardens around his home at Kumbosco near Bolgatanga in the Upper East region. Inside the gardens, Abarike has pigris. He has other livestock including guinea fowls, chickens, goats, and cattle, which freely roam the gardens or around his home. Abarike also has a fish pond, which he made from an old abandoned swimming pool close to his home. What I do is that because I grow pigs, I have poultry, I have some few sheep and goats, I use their manure to grow maggots and I lift some of the maggots to feed the fish. Then when the fish, when the, when the this thing decomposes small and the fish also excretes, the linkage is that I pump the water back to the farm. That will boost uh, uh, the cultivation of maize and leaf food and other things. When I pluck the maize, the cuttings are given to the pigs or the animals to, to grind and to turn into natural manure. So the agroecology perspective is just that you don't throw away the waste. The waste of one tends to be the resource for another. Agroecology is based on applying the interactions between plants, animals, humans and the environment within agricultural systems. By doing this, agroecology can support food production, food security, and nutrition whilst restoring the ecosystem. So we don't use uh, chemical fertilizer. So the effects of chemicalization is reduced. So if you buy from my garden, you are eating good vegetables. Fuseini Bogbon is a farmer and also a promoter of agroecology and organic farming. Bogbon has a six acre organic farm located at the Gundog community in the Nabdam district of the Upper East region. Just like Abarike, Bogbon also has a fish pond and rears livestock inside his farm. I don't use chemicals like pesticides and the rest, no. I've also planted trees because they share their leaves so that when they come in contact with the soil, they get blended, you see, and this helps the soil to be active. And what, whatever you plant grows well. Here at Karmenga, a northeast region community very close to the upper east region, Ibrahim Salifu also applies agroecology methods on his seven-acre farm. Salifu uses a method he calls no-till on his farm. Well, over here we really uh, practice uh, just very natural methods, the no-till farming, which is also very, very, very good. Yeah, you really don't have to turn the land so much. Because when you look at it, the nutrients require uh, the crop needs, it's just at the topsoil and not what is beneath. So you really don't do bending, you encourage mulching because you have to really consider the, the living organisms in the soil that also help. And just like Bogbon and Abarike, Salifu rears livestock which provide him manure so he does not need to use chemical fertilizers. Experts who advocate for agroecology say 
it impacts positively on the environment and sustains biodiversity. Dr. Kofi Boa is the founder and director of the Center for No-Till Agriculture. His center is dedicated to promoting and teaching the concepts of agroecology. As I speak to you now, machinery is available for agroecological farming. No-till planting systems that to just cut a slit through the mulch and plant without plowing, without doing that much disturbance. So agroecology can be done at large scale. Agroecology produces organic food and also sustains the ecosystem. It remains for governments and other investors to support farmers so that they can further improve on systems of African farming which have worked for centuries. Albert Sorry, Joy News, Bolgatanga. Meanwhile, the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, and the Ghana National Sesame Business Farmers Association have embarked on a street march to draw government's attention to the need to invest in agroecology in Ghana. The street march dubbed March for Agroecology took place at Bogatanga in the Upper East Region. Correspondent Albert Sorry reports again. The March for Agroecology was organized by the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana and the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development. They were joined by the Ghana National Sesame Business Farmers Association and other farmer associations. The march was supported by the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, OSIWA, the 11th Hour Project, and the Joint Action for Farmers' Organizations in West Africa. Wielding placards with various inscriptions, the participants marched through the principal streets of Bolgatanga to educate the public about the importance of applying agroecology farming methods. The march was also used as a means of drawing government's attention to the need to invest in agroecology to help address the impact of climate change on smallholder farmers in northern Ghana. The March for Agroecology ended at the Upper East Regional Office of the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, where the president of the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, Abdul Rahman Mohammed, presented a communique to be forwarded to the president head of programs and advocacy for the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana, Dr. Charles Nyaba, threw more light on the march and the communique issued. Climate change has serious impact on the activities of smallholder farmers in the Upper East region. Uh, the lands are almost desert now because we have cut all our trees. So we think that for us to be able to produce to feed the, today's generation and for the future, we need to adopt sustainable farming practice, which is agroecology. So for this reason, we have organized a training of uh, farmers, uh, MOFA directors, media people, and the civil society on agroecology farming so that they will also extend the same information to other farmers. We are making a proposal to the president that he should try to increase investment to support agroecology farming activities. Secondly, the president should also reconsider putting money to complete the dams that were under construction on the One Village One Dam. We realize that in the 2020 budget, there is no allocation for the One Village One Dam project. Executive Director for the Center for Indigenous Knowledge and Organizational Development, Bernard Guri, had this to add to the calls on government. That a plant breeders variety bill as it stands today goes along the line of the youth of 91 and this is a very rigid you know law which goes in favor of breeders it ties for the rights of breeders against the rights of farmers and we have asked president that although the bill has been passed in spite of all the advocates who did the president should not assent to it and the president should give farmers prison farmers in ghana the opportunity to work with our scientists to come up with our own law, what we call the Swiss generic system, is allowed globally. 
and who can come with our own law, that favors, that protects the rights of our farmers. Upper East Regional Director for the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, Francis Eno, received the communique on behalf of government. Our minister is very concerned that we are drifting or running away from the heavy equipment that we used to do. We are, the minister is bringing in simple, simple machines that our farmers can uh, utilize. Some have come already, more are yet to come. So. With this agroecology and the machining, specific machines, you will discuss with the engineering department to, to also look at them so that some of them too can be uh, brought into the country for use of our farmers. Albert Sorry, Joy News, Bolgatanga. And in Accra in the studios, my name is Aisha Prime. We'll take a break on Joy News Prime. We'll bring you business after this break. So we're back with business. Now, the largest iron steel industry in West Africa, B5 Plus Limited, says it has signed an agreement amounting to $8 million with Greco and VRA for a dedicated power line to aid its production. The company says this has become necessary because its biggest problem lies in the distribution channel, indicating that it is only able to produce 40% capacity with 60% losses because of unstable uh, supply of power. The chief executive of B5 Plus Limited, Mukesh Takwani, spoke with Joy Business's Odilia Ntiamwa ahead of the commissioning of a $100 million fabrication plant expected to employ not less than 20,000 people. What the little information we have uh, from the uh, energy uh, ministry is that we have excess of power. Our biggest problem lies in the distribution channel. So as of today we speak, we are only able to produce 40% of the production. So 60% we are having a loss. It is because of uh, supply of power we are not able to get. But the power is there. Power is not an issue. It's the supply chain which is having a problem. So currently we have uh, signed a contract with uh, Gridco and VRA which we are going to finance as a loan to them so that they are able to put a special line uh, to the site so we are able to get our, uh, our power. And, 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 you're, and you're looking at about how much are you giving to these two organizations? Uh, as it is a, a loan of $8 million mm -hmm. we have been able to organize. And you think that once this, this special line is delivered to you, it will solve the problem? 100% it will be able to solve the problem, mm. 100%. How is that going to affect your output once this is constructed for you? I think it will be a very uh, a positive uh, thing because the factory, it really requires a consistent power and a quality power. You know, so these are the two very important factors into the steel industry. So if we are able to get a consistent and uh, a good power, I think it will really make a, a big difference because too much fluctuations really spoils a lot of, uh, you know, today the machineries which are coming in, you know, high-tech machineries, they are having a lot of electronic parts. So if the fluctuations are too much, that's really, as of now, if I tell you last year alone, uh, to now, till now, we have blown up more than three transformers. So it's just because of the fluctuations. So once we are able to have a dedicated line, I'm sure that we will be able to put uh, this fluctuation uh, uh, problems out. How badly has this affected your bottom line? You've been in existence for 20 years. Um, in these 20 years, how badly has the factor of electricity alone um, affected your business? Well, it has affected a lot, and especially uh, uh, currently, you know, because of our new uh, plant under 1D1F, uh, which is uh, located in Lapleku. So, as it required uh, one district, one factory, so we decided to put it outside uh, a thema so that we are able to create uh, more jobs into that particular uh, region. And uh, I think uh, it was really uh, challenging because as of today we speak to you, we are getting into the third year now and still we are having a problem of electricity, water and the access of roads. Mm -hmm and security is also one Amisha. of the uh, bigger concerns. Mm. Tell us about the project that you'll be commissioning on the 13th. It's supposed to employ um, 
directly and indirectly about 20,000 Ghanaians. It's a one district, one factory project. You have invested as much as a hundred million dollars. Tell us about this project. Uh, currently, uh, the project which is going to be inaugurated uh, by His Excellency uh, Nana Kufadu, that is going to be the fabrication a plant which we did an expansion of that. That's the one phase. And uh, we are going to start our steel plant and that is giving, as of today we speak to you already right now, 5,000 jobs directly and indirectly are being affected by that. So this is a new addition and we are going to start the second phase also of the project. I would like to add on here is that uh, it will not only be able to save more than $100 million into the foreign exchange, that is, I think, uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges of uh, uh, Ghana industry. Uh, industry. So we'll be saving uh, the foreign exchange and at the same time, we'll be creating more thousands of jobs. And more than that, a lot of auxiliary industries like, you know, we are able to produce the goods uh, for uh, fabrication uh, segment, uh, for industrial segment, for residential, commercial, and many distributors. Mm. So I think it is really in the mining sector as well. So we are able to give a lot of uh, uh, oxygen to the uh, auxiliary industries. And I think that is uh, one of the uh, biggest advantage, which we really don't see in the real number. But at the end, it really able to provide a lot of job opportunities, provide a quality steel at uh, competitive rates. So more and more uh, people are able to build the houses and more and more people are able to distribute the houses. Today we are very proud to say we are more than 1,000 distributors across Ghana. Mm. How would you say this is a 1D1F one um, project? How does it become 1D1F one when it's fully funded by, by your organization? Yes, uh, uh, this uh, project so far it has been uh, funded uh, by uh, B5 uh, uh, Plus and uh, their uh, financiers. We are in uh, touch with the uh, uh, government of Ghana to uh, please uh, give us a preferential uh, rate should be given so that uh, our costs can be low and we can be more competitive into uh, the market. Mm -hmm. So we are really uh, in a talk with the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Finance and Ministry of People to see that how best we can have access to the funds at a lower rate so that we can become more competitive. Mm, mm, mm. Does it look like this is something that has been well received? Is there any special regime you're enjoying currently, or for instance? Well, uh, as far uh, under 1D1F, uh, uh, whatever uh, is required, uh, we have put up our uh, applications with uh, Ministry of uh, Trade and Finance. We have got approvals from all trade and uh, finance is going to uh, parliament so i'm sure that because of covid it has uh, delayed but uh, we have been given assurance that it will be surely done mm. so we are very optimistic and once president come and see himself i'm sure that he'll be proud that what b5 plus has created it is not only about uh, uh, making the made in ghana goods but making proudly made in ghana goods because if you really look at our structure, if you really look at uh, the quality of the products we are producing and at the price, I'm sure that it is really going to make His Excellency Nana Kufado proud that he started this 1D1F initiative. It is not only creating jobs, but making sure that made in Ghana goods are really true sense happening right here in Ghana. Mm. What are your general thoughts of the um, construction industry in Ghana. We have a huge housing deficit. We have a, f a huge road deficit. Um, the general construction um, arena of the country, um, we have some huge deficit, especially if we want to be the nerve center for the discussion and implementation of the continental free trade. If we say that we're indeed the gateway to West Africa, we definitely will have to see more infrastructural development. Project, yeah. Yes. What would you say we should be concentrating on as a country um, and your general thoughts about the construction sector? 
I think uh, a lot is uh, required uh, into the construction uh, segment, you rightly said. We really need to, we have a big gap into the residential side. We have a big gap into the road infrastructure and the railway net work. But uh, what we are seeing recently that the government of Ghana is really putting up a lot of initiatives to see that uh, uh, those projects, some of them have already started and some of them are in the pipeline. So I'm sure that uh, uh, with uh, His Excellency uh, vision, we will be able to achieve a more uh, better road networks and the railway networks and infrastructure project into the uh, coming uh, years. I took a look at your, uh, your corporate portfolio, mm -hmm. buildings that you have invested in, 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 in the area of, of course, your products. Um, can you share some with us? I know that, uh, um, which, which buildings? I know Villaggio, I mean, they have used some of your, your yeah. products. Uh, yeah, if you could just go through. We can see Accra Mall, uh, mm -hmm. Villaggio, or the stadiums in uh, Accra, uh, Kumasi, uh, it was supplied by us. If you talk about Flagstaff House, you talk about Tetequa Shiran about, you talk about Tema Runabout, and many more uh, prestigious projects. We are very proud of Max Line Building. We are very proud to say that the B5 Plus has been always the leader into uh, steel supplies. We are known for our quality, price and delivery on time. Mm. And we can assure you that B5 Plus is going to move ahead with uh, uh, this, our vision of making all the steel products right here in Ghana. Mm. What would you give us an advice for um, entrepreneurs who would want to go into the construction sector? What should they do? Well, uh, you have I've, been here for 20 years. Yes, I have been in Africa for 33 years, 27 okay. years okay. in Ghana. Okay. So wow. I'll, I'll say that Ghana is. <laughs> you are Ghanaian. Is, I'm a Ghanaian. <laughs> is my, uh, Ghana is. I eat Ghana food. My children are born here. Yeah. And uh, we believe in Ghana. That's mm. the most important thing. Mm. And that was an extensive interview with the B5 Plus CEO uh, by Odilia Antiamwa. And in business, coming up next is Sports This Day. Thank you for staying with us on Joy News Prime. Time now for the sport again. Gary L. Smith here. The WBC has introduced a new weight class in the heavyweight division. This means that a new set of world champions will emerge before the end of the year. The United Nations Association of Ghana Commission for Women and Children Affairs has reached an agreement with the former IBF light welterweight champion Richard Comey to have him serve as a goodwill ambassador of the commission. The former IBF um, lightweight champion has been speaking to us about what it all means. And where I grew up and where I come from, it has always been an honor for me to always give back to where I'm from, you know, from Bukum, from Accra. So when the call came and I spoke to my manager, we were like, we were so happy to be working with him. You know, I mean, being recognized by this organization, I mean, uh, UNA, I mean, UN, United Nations Association of Ghana, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable and I'm the only boxer to be, I mean, to be recognized. So, you know, I mean, that tells me that I'm doing the right thing or we're doing something great. So, within my power as a former world champion and with uh, streetwise management behind me, we're going to do everything we got to do just to champion this course. And like we said, like I said, I mean, my manager said earlier on, we've got this foundation trying to help to give back to our community. So, we're going to do that. And also, we all know women are supreme. I mean, mothers are supreme. Well, I mean, without women, there will be no me, there will be no most of us here. So it's always great to, I mean, fight for women. And they brought us to this world, and we have no right to dis disrespect one. Or, I mean, uh, minus them in everything that we do. I mean, women always bring development, and they bring, I mean, uh, I mean, how do you call it? Like, Shulimo, how do you call it? <laughs> like, no, yeah, right, in Gagan foot me, sorry. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a great call, and I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do whatever I gotta do just to, uh, just to, uh, I mean, do what I gotta do to promote this going to, I mean, to whatever I can do to help a, a champion this course, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm re in football, the Wonder Club Great Olympics top the Ghana Premier League with 33 points after 18 games. They are a point above second place as Ante Kotoko and head coach of the team, that's Olympics, is Anna Walker. 
He's cautiously optimistic about their title success. Here's a Joy Sports report by Mufta Nabula Abdullahi. The Wonder Club continued their stay at the summit of the league table with a 1-0 win over Midiama Essie in the opening game of the second round of the Ghana Premier League. Football pundits are predicting that Great Olympics might just win the Premier League for the first time since the 1970s. However, head coach of the team, Anna Walker, is cautiously optimistic of his team's chances of becoming champions at the end of the season. God willingly, God willingly. That's why I said on the quiet, I don't want to rush and say I will win the league. I want to be in the first four. But if God should do me a favor, or he should see my handiwork and gives me the, the trophy, I will say hallelujah and thank God. Olympics had a very good run in the first round of the Premier League season after 17 games. Their good start in the second round, according to Anoroka, is just the beginning of greater things they want to do this year. Yes, of course, yes. Uh, we went to uh, Takwa and uh, we have to draw with them, which uh, nobody expected to even come back with a, a point. But God willingly, uh, God made it for us, and uh, we had a drawn game there. But when the, the second round started, we made them the same thing, and uh, we beat them. So, like people are uh, imagining or thinking about, is is the same Olympics. We are taking match after match, and. Uh, uh, we finish with them, we are taking off Legon City. And that's the preparation we are having towards them. Occupies the summit of the Premier League table with 33 points. Their next game is against Legon Cities, an opposition they defeated 3-0 in the first round of the competition. Let's do some Europa League football. Um, Arsenal are in action and they are drawing 1-1 one, one in their game with Slavia Prague. Ajax 1, Roma 2, and that is also a game that is ongoing. Manchester United 2, Granada 0. Manchester United 2, Granada 0. So that's the update there um, in the Europa League. Interesting stuff, isn't it? Anyway, Hans Mensa Ando will be here at 10.30 to bring you the highlights of as many games as possible. That, though, is the sport for now. I'm Gary Al Smith. Thank you for your time. And as I wrap up the bulletin tonight, my name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. For more news, log on to myjohnline.com. You'll get more of the news there and updates of the developing stories. Enjoy the rest of our programs.